Good morning. Where have you people been? It is weird preaching in an empty building. Except we had the sound booth guys, uh, but they weren't listening, but <laughs> they were here. By the way, I do appreciate uh, uh, Tim and Rick and Tamara. They, they didn't miss us a, a week. They were here every week to record uh, the messages and post them. And uh, do appreciate their faithfulness. Amen. Amen. And I hope you've been watching what they've been posting. Uh, <clears throat> I said it's weird preaching to an empty building. Now it's kind of weird preaching with people here. <laughs> Got to get used to that again. But uh, before I start, I've got to share something with you. On Facebook, somebody posted 10 ways the coronavirus is like my pastor's preaching. <laughs> Have any of y'all seen this? I'm hoping one of our members didn't do this. Listen to this. 10 ways the coronavirus is like my pastor's preaching. Number one, it just, it just keeps getting worse. <laughs> Actually, it's getting better, isn't it? People keep asking, is it over yet? The young folks don't take it seriously. You probably won't get it. <laughs> the virus or the message. Most people affected are senior citizens. It makes it easier to stay home. But I'm glad you didn't. Number seven, it has shut down a lot of churches. Some pastors preaching and shut down churches. Number eight, people are making grocery lists <laughs> while he's preaching. I thought you was taking notes. Number nine, once it started, everyone has to go to the bathroom. And number ten, people wanted to hurry up and end so they could be first to the restaurants. <laughs> Have any of you been to the restaurants the last couple of days? Two or three of you? Are you wanting to go today? If not, I'll just keep preaching. Don't have to worry about you having to go to the restaurant. But I hope that wasn't posted by a member of this church, because Matt's really a lot better than that. <laughs> Take your Bibles. Let's go to Psalm 137. Have you felt like you've been in captivity? These past few weeks, we've been told to stay at home, not to get out unless necessary. And uh, many have felt they've lost a lot of their liberties. And uh, there's a lot of complaints about all of this, and uh, we won't get into that. But uh, we have lost a lot of our liberties. Some have actually been arrested. I saw one lady had taken, taken her child to the public park and got arrested for being out. Uh, some of these parking lot services are being fined. So it's a crazy time that we've been going through. And I want to talk to you this morning about Christians in captivity. And in the 137th Psalm, we note the Israelites here were in captivity. They had lost their liberty in Babylonian captivity. And you know the Psalms are the Jews' hymn book. They would sing the Psalms. And uh, this 137th Psalm might belong in the blues category. Uh, they are singing the blues here. It was written by a captive. And uh, to give you a little background of the Psalm, God had been good to Israel as he's been good to America. Amen? God gave Israel three things. He gave them their land, he gave them their law, and he gave them their Lord. But what did they do? They defiled the land, they defied the laws, and they denied the Lord when they turned to idolatry. This is what caused God to have to bring judgment upon them. He allowed a pagan king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar to come in with his armies and defeat the Jews and carried many of them off to Babylon into captivity. So this psalm was written out of captivity. This is a song of saints in captivity. 
Now what I want to do is look at this and uh, let's think about those who are living in spiritual captivity. Because that's possible. There are those who are in bondage to the world. Some are in bondage to their fleshly desires or to the devil. And that's not what God intended. God wants us to live free, to have these liberties. If the Son shall make you free, ye shall be what? Free indeed. Every Christian is free born. We're not meant to live in bondage. Sin is to no longer have dominion over you. Now some will say, well, preacher, we can't live completely free. What does the Bible say? Thanks be unto God who causes us always to triumph in Christ Jesus. He gives us that victory. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. But it's sad when Christians who are meant to be free are in captivity. By the way, Babylon and Jerusalem, you often see them contrasted in the Bible. Babylon means confusion. What does Jerusalem mean? City of peace, shalom. So you can live in the city of peace, or you can live in a state of confusion. But that's not God's will for his children. We're living in a day and time, just as Israel was, we're living in a world of iniquity, a world of idolatry, a world of immorality. And we can allow that to affect us, can't we? And those who do end up living in bitterness. They live in barrenness. They live in brokenness. Zion is where we should live. That stands for the kingdom of God. So let's look at this. In Psalm 137, let's look at the first six verses here. It says, By the rivers of Babylon... There we sat down, yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there they that carried us away captive required of us a song. And they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? But I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy. So a song of saints in captivity. As, as I said, we were saved and we are to live in liberty and freedom, dwelling spiritually in Jerusalem. But we can, if we're not careful... We can be carried away into captivity. Now the captivity we've been experiencing, the quarantine and all that, is one thing. But we want to be careful not to be caught up in being in captivity of what this world's all about. So if you want to take notes, let me share four thoughts with you. First of all, we see here a languishing misery. They were languishing, sitting by the rivers, weeping. Weeping in misery. Because they're God's people, and they've been taken out of the land that God had given them, and now they are in bondage to a pagan king. They're miserable. Now, folks, God did not fix it where you cannot sin anymore. As believers, we can sin. But God did fix it where we cannot sin and enjoy it anymore. Amen? Amen? When you get away from God and you get back into the world, you're going to lose something. You're going to lose the joy of your salvation. You're going, to, you're going to lose that fellowship that you once had with God and God's people. He'll seek to bring you back if you're off in captivity. Let's ask a couple of questions here. Number one, who caused them to be carried into captivity? Not really Nebuchadnezzar, it was God. God caused this to happen. Now God had promised them that he would keep them safe, protect them, provide for them. He would defeat their enemies if they would follow him. 
But if you don't, he says, I will allow the enemy to come in and devour the land. So God calls them to be in captivity and to be in this misery. There's a story, let me show, I've shared this before, but I was thinking about this. And what God will sometimes do to get our attention. It says, once there was a wayward family who had no interest in God or his church or the things of God, there was a father and his three sons, Jim, John, and Sam. Now, they belonged to a church. That church constantly tried to reach out to them and, and to restore them to fellowship and get them back involved in, in the work of the Lord, the church. But uh, to no avail. This family was backslidden in captivity to this world. Well, one day, one of the boys was out in the pasture, and he was bit by a rattlesnake. And he became seriously ill. They called the doctor, and the doctor came in. And he said, well, I've done all I can. It's up to God now. So they called for the pastor to come and pray. And he came. And here's his prayer. He said, O oh, wise and righteous Heavenly Father, we thank thee. For thou hast in thy wisdom sent this rattlesnake to bite John in order to bring him to his senses. He will not darken the door of your church. He takes no interest in you or right living. He feels no need to pray. That we trust this will prove to be a valuable lesson to him. That it will lead to genuine repentance on his part. And now, O oh Father, wilt thou send another snake to bite Sam? <laughs> not this one. Another to bite Jim. And a big one to bite the old man. We've been doing all we can for years to get them to look to you, but to no avail. It seems that all of our efforts could not do what that one snake has done. We thus conclude that the only thing left that will do this family any good is Lord send us bigger and better rattlesnakes. In Jesus' name we pray. Is that what it takes? Sometimes God has to really bring people down to get their attention. There was a time God sent snakes, wasn't there? You read over Numbers chapter 21, verse 6, The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people died. God had to do that to bring judgment upon a wayward people. So he calls them to go into captivity. They were separated from their father, surrounded by their foes, saddened by their failure, shackled by their fears. Second question is, not only who calls them to go into captivity, but what caused them? Or why did God do this? As we said, they had been disobeying God's commandments. They've been going after other gods, seeking the things of this world. So God sent them to a place of captivity that they might consider what they've done and where they are. Now, here's the thing. Okay, Brother West, here's another history lesson from Israel. What's that got to do with us? Well, let me make some applications. Israel was judged because they forsook God. They were worshiping idols. Is America guilty of that? I'm talking about as a nation. Has America as a nation forsaken God? Are they involved in idolatry? Because anything you put before God is an idol. So if they turn from God, they've turned to something else. So America is just as guilty as Israel was. So could, has God sent us into captivity with this pandemic to get our focus back on him? Should America pay attention to what this is all about? Let me remind you, the most miserable person on earth is not an unsaved person. It's a saved person out of God's will. They're the most miserable because they're out of God's will, sitting by the rivers of Babylon, weeping in captivity. 
So we see first a languishing misery. Secondly, we see a lingering memory. It says, when we remembered Zion. Now Zion is kind of the poetic name for Jerusalem. That was the, clay, the place of their temple, the place of glad singing, the place of, of sacrifices, a place where God was real to them. They remembered Zion as they sat by the rivers of Babylon. I'm hoping that the past six weeks, people being in captivity, they be remembered how it was in the past. Remember some better days in America. When America truly was a Christian nation seeking to follow the Lord God. Now, some don't have a memory of Zion because they've never experienced it. I'm talking about those that are not saved. They don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. They're in Babylon, but they don't weep because they have no memory. There's nothing for them to remember concerning God because they've never had any experience with God, right? They've never met the Lord. They don't know Him as Lord. They never were saved. So they have no memory. It's like we read in 1 John 2, 19. John said they went out from us, but they were not of us. For had they been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. Folks, the church is more than a building. It's the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. The backslider doesn't leave a building. He leaves the people of God. Right? He leaves the people of God. I was reading something the other day. You know, a leech can attach itself to your body, but it's never really a part of your body. And there are some that are spiritual leeches. People can attach themselves to the body, sucking all the benefits and blessings they can out of it. And when the blood is gone, they find another body to latch on. They never become part of that body. We have people who go back into the world. They go back to their old life because they don't remember. They have no memory as a child of God what it's like to truly be in God's will and God's fellowship. Do you have a time, a place in your memory when Christ became real to you? I hope so. A time when there was fullness, joy, and peace. Some don't have a memory. Some should have a memory of Zion. I remember... My salvation, I remember giving my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. I remember being baptized, becoming a member of the Lord's church. There's some, who, although they've been a profession of faith in Christ, they don't remember what it once was. Can you remember praying? You couldn't pray without crying. As you prayed for lost loved ones, lost friends. For revival. Do you remember getting happy and praising the Lord, wanting to stand up and, and shout, Glory to God! Praise the Lord. But now your heart is cold and indifferent. But you can remember how it used to be. Some are in captivity, and yet they've got this lingering memory. Of how it used to be. They need to get that back. Amen. Then number three. We see a, a laughing mockery. A laughing mockery. Verses two and three. Here, the Babylonians are really mocking the Jews here. Look at the ridicule. They're saying to the Jews. Hey. Why don't you sing us one of your songs of Zion. Show us how happy you are in your Lord. They were just sneering and laughing at these people who were the children of God and yet they're in bondage. I'll tell you something. 
the world today mocks the Christian who's not living for Jesus. Amen. The devil laughs at those who are now in captivity. He likes to put them on display, doesn't he? You see, it is Christ in our lives that should make the difference in how we live compared to how they live in the world. You know, the world, they, they love to homogenize Babylon and Zion. They, they want to bring us together. They want us to sing God's song in a strange land. You know, it's kind of strange how a lot of these worldly singers will have a concert. And they'll sing all their songs about uh, fornication and drugs and drunkenness and rebellion. Then they want to close the show by singing Amazing Grace. Amen. Don't you find that strange? Amen. They want to mix a little gospel with their worldly ballads. Folks, the carnal believer is a laughing stock. Give you an example. Remember Samson? Samson was a judge of God. God has set him aside, called him to a great position. But Samson wanted to live among the Philistines. He wanted to marry one of their girls. What happened to Samson? They put out his eyes. They bound him and made sport of him. How they mocked old Samson. Folks, the greatest tragedy of a backslider living in Babylon is he becomes a shame. He becomes a disgrace to his God. Folks, we should rather want to die than to ever bring shame to our Lord. Two or three of us feel that way. A young teenage Christian girl was out with her friends and her friends wanted to go to this party where there's a lot of drinking going on. She said, no, I'll tell you what, just, just take me home. I, I don't want to go. So they started making fun of her. Oh, what's the matter? Are you afraid your daddy will hurt you? She said, no, I'm afraid I'll hurt my daddy. I don't want to do anything that would hurt my father. No, we should be that way. Not wanting to grieve our Lord. It leads to the ridiculous. The world loves to point out the hypocrites, the carnal believers. See, when we live for the Lord Jesus Christ, we make them uncomfortable. Why, why do they want us to sin with them? Why do they want us to drink with them? And they'll mock you and make fun of you, do everything they can to get you to go along with them. Because see, when you don't, it's conviction. They're convicted of their lifestyle when you don't run with them. What happens when believers go into captivity? Well, there's a languishing misery. There's a lingering memory. There's a laughing mockery. As I said, they'll sing our songs if we'll sing their songs. Think about Christmas. There's, there's a lot of the worldly crowd. They'll come together and sing Away in a Manger. They'll sing uh, Sweet Little Jesus Boy. But they don't believe Sweet Little Jesus Boy is the sovereign of this universe. They don't believe that. They'll sing those songs. Then they'll turn around and sing worldly, lusty ballads with liquored breath. It's just mockery. Here's the last thought. We see a lacking melody. They had lost their song in Babylon. How did we get our song? As Christians, how did we get our song? The, the song of deliverance. Psalm 32 verse 7 says, Thou art my hiding place, 
Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. We've got a song to sing, don't we? Songs of redemption. A song that we've been delivered. A soul set free. You know the first recorded song in the Bible where it's found? It's found in the book of Exodus chapter 15. The song was of Moses and the Lamb. It was the song the Israelites sang as they came out of Egyptian bondage. Can you imagine a couple million people singing with all their hearts a song of deliverance? Praising God who had delivered them from Egyptian bondage. Now we come together to sing the songs of Zion, the songs of the freeborn. As David said in Psalm 40, verse 2, he brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet up on a rock and established my goings. He put a song in my mouth. Is that true? Psalm 32, verse 7. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. Now I want to ask you, have you lost a song in your heart? So Brother West, what would rob us of that song? Would sorrow rob us? Would suffering rob us of that song? No. The only thing that will rob you of your song is sin. Sorrow, suffering does it. Hey, Jesus, the night before he was crucified, established the Lord's Supper that uh, spoke of his broken body and shed blood, what he was about to experience. What did they do when they left? They sang a hymn. The, the sorrow that encompassed Jesus did not steal his song. He still had a song to sing. Remember Paul and Silas in the Philippian jail? Been beaten, bound in a dungeon, suffering. Did that rob them of their song? No. They sang praises unto God in that dungeon. Hey, that concert brought the house down, didn't it? <laughs> God, God sent an earthquake of applause. Or they're singing. Hey, God gives us songs in the night. Job 35, verse 10. But none saith, Where is God my maker who giveth songs in the night? Sorrow, suffering cannot take away your song. Adversity and pain cannot do it. Now we've been housebound for some time. I've noticed a lot of folks on Facebook singing in captivity. Like I heard Phyllis singing on Facebook. Some of the others. I saw some, some communities around the world, people going out on their terraces and on their balconies, all these neighbors singing together. You've seen some of those? Singing. Captivity did not rob them of their song. I thought about that. Sometimes we come to the house of God, we have a song service, and some don't sing. There is a song that says this, Brother Sam, let those refuse to sing who never knew our God. But children of the heavenly king shall sing their joys abroad. It's kind of convicting, isn't it? Let those refuse to sing who never knew our God. They don't have anything to sing about. There's no memory of an experience with God. But let the children of the heavenly king sing their joys abroad. So I'll preach you. You just don't understand. I'm not a good singer. Well, I'm not either. But that doesn't rob me of my song. I'm still going to sing. Yeah, it's not that I can't carry a tune. I can carry it. I just can't unload it properly. I miss the laughter. When I'm preaching to an empty building, 
I was going to tell Rick, can we find a laugh track <laughs> to insert? The Bible says, Ephesians 5, 19, that we are to sing and make melody in our heart to the Lord. Let's don't let this rob us of our song. These captives in Babylon hung their harps and refused to sing. Did you know that every Christian has a harp? The harp of the heart. Where it says, making melody in your heart. That Greek, that's a Greek word that means to strum a harp. Our singing, my heart is my harp. And with it, I can praise the Lord. Don't let the world, don't let what's going on rob you. Of your joy. Don't let it rob you of your song. Keep singing. We can still praise the Lord. Because all this stuff we're going through, it didn't, it didn't take God by surprise, did it? God knew it was coming. God prepared for it. 